Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the, I believe, 15th MCC at home, just to give this morning a bit of a date stamp, if you like. We've got school holidays coming up soon, uh, which uh, I trust everyone is looking forward to. Uh, feels like things are getting a little bit uh, a little bit back to, um, to norm. I don't want to use that term, new normal, it's probably been overdone. But whatever the future holds, it seems like it's getting less strange, hopefully, fingers crossed. Thank you for joining us this morning. Great to have you with us. And again, a particularly big welcome to any visitors amongst us. We've got a whole lot in store for you this morning. Uh, we've got, we'll, we'll be picking back up our long running series on the Sermon on the Mount. So I'll be speaking on that, blessed are the peacemakers very, very soon. After that, we've got a really fun interview with, uh, with Ro, a longstanding member of our congregation. Can't wait for that. And we've got Dave doing communion and then we've got more music and children's story to wrap up with. So again, a whole lot to look forward to this morning. Before we get any further, I just wanna say a big thank you to everyone who has participated in our survey. That's closed now, but we had, I think, you know, at least at the stage of filming this, 57 respondents, which was just amazing, more than we expected. So thank you for taking the time to fill it in. We are much, much, much uh, looking forward to uh, collating the results of that, so thanks. And now without further ado, let me offer a quick prayer and then we'll get into the Sermon on the Mount. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you that again, um, whilst there's still um, a heap of uncertainty about the future, things seem to be drifting more and more towards, um, I guess, uh, like a, a, new, um, a new and improved sense of pr um, predictability and certainty and normalcy. So we thank you for that. We thank you that the kids are back at school. We thank you also for the school holidays that are coming up in a couple of weeks. And as we open up your word this morning, Father, and learn together, we thank you that you've called us to be peacemakers. I pray that we'll take this privilege seriously. Uh, I pray that we won't just be people who are peaceful. I pray that we won't just be people who are easygoing. But I pray that we will be active peacemakers who show initiative when it comes to trying to reconcile people and groups, Father. Help us see that this just reflects your character and that of your son, who is the ultimate peacemaker. And I thank you that we have each other, for encouragement. I thank you that we have the empowerment of your spirit. And I thank you that we have the guidance of scripture to help us in this probably more urgent and necessary and critical task now more than ever before. Amen. And now back to the Sermon on the Mount. 
I was out at dinner with some friends the other night. So this is the first dinner out in a while, obviously. So everyone was having a really good, jovial time. Now, one of my friends shared just a, like, you know, kind of harmless anecdote about a family member and it involved a questionable purchasing choice. So did the family member, did they really need to buy, let's just call it X? And that is when I did the exact right thing. And I offered an empathetic comment that really helped this first family member see things from the other person's perspective. No, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> Instead, what I did was lean in and offer an unsolicited joke about the family member's spending. Now, it wasn't malicious and it was mildly funny, but it was completely unnecessary, right? Completely unnecessary. And it didn't do anything to bring about any kind of peace between these two family members. If anything, what I should have done is I should have offered some kind of conciliatory comment, or I should have at least just shut up and let the discussion die out. But instead, for the sake of some cheap laughs, I threw away the opportunity to be a peacemaker. And honestly, I've been regretting that. It's been on my mind, obviously, since. So thanks for listening. I feel absolved. I mean, I can see why those reality TV contestants get sucked in to those confessional booths and just start spilling their guts to the camera. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, this week's talk, it's looking at the seventh beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount. And that is, if you haven't guessed already, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, I won't have time to provide a decent recap of the past, I think, six or seven sermons that we've already done on this series. So if you want to or you need to, I'd strongly encourage you to check them out on our YouTube channel. This morning, I'm hoping to do the following. First of all, I want to look at what being a peacemaker is and also isn't. Second, I'll do a quick tour, a very quick tour through at least one good reason as to why I think it's so essential at the moment. And lastly, and this will be for the bulk of our time together, lastly and thirdly, I'll suggest some ways to practically go about or start being a peacemaker. So, number one, what is, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> what is being a cheesemaker? Sorry, peacemaker, what is being a peacemaker? Well, as usual, it's often handy to look at what it's not. So remember that with all these Beatitudes, Jesus is describing a new way of being human, a countercultural counter -cultural way of being human, which reflects his very nature, that is, the nature of God. So whatever being a peacemaker is, we can be pretty certain that it's not typical. And for what it's worth, this is the only place in the entire scripture that this phrase, peacemaker is used. So that also suggests that there's something special about it. So being a peacemaker, we can safely assume, is not about just being easygoing. And it's certainly not about having peace at any cost. And we know this given God's desire for righteousness and justice. So peacemaking just can't be about um, tolerating injustice for the sake of it all just wanting us all to, to get along. And it's certainly not about denying minimizing or ignoring the very real differences between people and the grievances, the often real grievances that have been done. Lord Jones, the great Welsh preacher and theologian who I often quote, he does a neat job of first defining peacemaking passively and then actively. So he says, using a beautiful but really archaic sounding word, peacemakers shouldn't be quarrelsome. In other words, they shouldn't be easy to pick a fight with, right? Now, I guess this also means by extension that to be a peacemaker will mean not being easily offended. And it certainly must also mean not being unduly defensive as a person. Okay, so that's the, the passive meaning of the term. On the more, I guess, active side, being a peacemaker, it's gonna mean taking initiative. So again, it's not about just having a peaceful temperament. 
And it's not even about being a pacifist. Instead, it's actually being a peacemaker. It's about people who actually make peace happen. So Scott McKnight, another, another um, theologian who's got a lot of good stuff to say about the Sermon on the Mount, he sees it as an active entrance into the middle of warring parties for the purpose of creating a reconciliation and peace. Now, if you're at all familiar with world history over the past, say, 50 years at least, you'll see, you'll know how risky actively entering into the middle of warring parties for the sake of peace can be. So that begs the question, well, why would you? And if for no other reason, because this endeavor, as Ben Knight says, of reconciliation, it mirrors the character of God. And it's what the world needs and will always need. So check out this, uh, this next quote from pastor, author, theologian, David Fitch. He writes, We tolerate each other in the melting pot of antagonism while the world hungers for love. Meanwhile, the Bible says that God is working for the reconciliation, there's that word again, of the whole world to himself in Christ. We are now ambassadors of Christ, entrusted with a message of reconciliation. What a great quote. And it's so true, right? We can be so busy just keeping a lid on things. We want to tolerate, 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 because we don't want it to all, to all boil over, right? When God, all that time, is offering so much more than just tolerance, he's offering complete and utter reconciliation based on love. And our job as his followers and members of this new kingdom that the Beatitudes are describing, it's to be ambassadors and examples of this peace and reconciliation. What a privilege. And this is radical, not only because it's preaching love when the world preaches largely tolerance, but also because its end goal is reconciliation. Again, not just tolerance, not just a kind of simmering but peaceful coexistence. Now, that may sound like no big deal, but think about it like this. For peacemaking and reconciliation to take place, relationships need to be first restored. And for relationships to be restored properly, there's no place for winners and losers. And there's really no place for vindication and punishment to be the final or even the primary goal. Now, I don't know about you, but honestly, I still sometimes get a bit of a perverse kick out of being vindicated and winning arguments and disputes. It's hard to let go of. But peacemaking is about reconciliation. And there's no room for winners, losers, vindication, punishment for good reconciliation. Okay, so that's what it may be about. But why is it so, so important? Well, there's plenty of reasons. Let me just focus on one for the sake of time. We need more peacemakers because they work at the heart level. They're wanting to see people's hearts changed as they're reconciled to God and then to each other. And let's be honest, it's a changed heart that has the best chance to sustain long-lasting and genuine peace. Because if people don't change from the inside, then despite our and society's best efforts, despite our improving laws, despite our wanting to better social standards and norms, despite our putting cameras just about everywhere so that someone could always be watching what you're doing, despite these often admirable and effective techniques, strategies and technology, at best, they're only going to bring about short term and or surface level change. My parents grew up in the 60s. They, and probably some of you, could probably recall seeing the horrific images of the 1963 Birmingham riots. Police dogs and fire hydrants being unleashed upon black protesters. But things have moved on from then, right? I mean, I think it was in 64 the Civil Rights Act came in. I grew up in the 90s and I can still remember being both horrified and glued to the TV watching footage of Rodney King get beaten up in 1991 and the rights and the protests that followed. 
but that's ancient history, right? I mean, since then, we've had the internet come online proper. We've had globalization. We've got information, learning, wisdom, all at our fingertips. So surely we'll evolve. And now here we are in 2020. And that's just one example. It actually pains me that after working out of school and also having sons now at school, I know that some of the same words myself and my mates were stupidly using as insults back in the 80s and the 90s. They're still in high rotation. They haven't gone away. It's like, man, can't we, can't we change? I know that on so many important levels, things are improving, or at least they were. The people, we don't seem to change so easily or that much in terms of our heart conditions, our fear, our selfishness, our greed, our envy, our lust for power. All of these require a changed heart, a new way of living, which is dependent upon reconciliation with God first and foremost, and then with our fellow humans. It requires genuine peacemaking. So that's a good reason why it's so needed right now, which leads to my last point, what peacemaking may involve. So I'll begin with a couple of specific behaviors and work our way back to some attitudes and beliefs and stuff. So here's the first specific suggestion. Being more of a peacemaker may actually start by saying less, or at least let's be more judicious about what we say. In the book of James, a New Testament letter, James writes in chapter 1, verse 19, he writes to the church, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Sage wisdom right there. Being quick to listen and slow to speak may save us from saying something rash and needlessly inflaming a situation, which is going to be the complete opposite of peacemaking, as well as keeping us from repeating things that actually don't bear repeating, which could lead to the very opposite of reconciliation. Now, I know this sounds obvious, right? It sounds like folk wisdom. It sounds cliched, but maybe it's harder to do. Maybe we need to hear this wisdom more, sound more now than ever, because the world is just replete with high-speed internet connections, multiple platforms, and a world of likes and thumbs up, which provides just a little microdose of dopamine every time someone hits one for you. We don't have to opine on everything. We don't have to buy into the current line of it always being brave to speak your mind. Sometimes, it's going to be brave to speak your mind. Sometimes it's actually needed to speak your mind. But sometimes it's also just going to be self-indulgent to speak our mind. Getting something off our minds doesn't have to involve tweeting, posting, or sending. Sometimes all you need to do is get a journal or a dog. You talk to one, you write on the other. Just don't get those mixed up. <laughs> Lastly, we need to remember that being a peacemaker involves and is about something bigger than us. Now, this bit of application, if you like, is Christian specific. This beatitude says that blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called children of God. Now, in this context, someone will be referred to as a child of God, not because they're entitled to something of God's, like an inheritance, but because their character, their personality, their traits, if you like, they resemble God's, just the way that a child's often does a parent's. So we want to be peacemakers, as that's one of our family's traits. If you look at the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, Paul, the author, he writes that if someone is in Christ, they have a relationship with Jesus. They are a new creation. The old is gone. They have that, that new heart that we talked about before. He then goes on to say that this comes from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus, and specifically Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, just stop there for a second. Just pause. God initiated 
and brought about the means by which we, people, can be reconciled to him. This is God, the sovereign of the universe, the creator. He proactively made a way of reconciliation possible. Even though he was the innocent one, the wronged party in his relationship with people. And the means of reconciliation was costly and humiliating. God becomes flesh, suffers and dies. God is the ultimate peacemaker and reconciler. And note that in addition to all of that in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 5, Paul goes on to write, Now God has entrusted you, that is us, if you're a follower of his, with that message of reconciliation and peacemaking. And presumably not just with a message, but a call to embody it. Because we are his ambassadors. That's what Paul writes. So we're supposed to promote and exemplify that message of costly, sacrificial peacemaking. What does this matter? Well, if I make a stupid joke that doesn't further peacemaking, I've just cost God an opportunity to be known via my peacemaking efforts. Or if I have a fight, like a big time conflict with another Christian, or even worse, if I have a beef with some other church, you know, um, or if I can't be bothered about social justice, if I neglect the cause of peacemaking on behalf of the poor, the orphan and the widow, if I say, look, I'm sorry, but it's just all too complicated, um, I'm too busy to do to prayerfully do my research and consider all the different perspectives and voices involved. And look, <laughs> it doesn't directly involve me anyway. The consequences of that go far beyond me and my measly reputation. The consequences, the bad reputation, the, the impotency to actually achieve reconciliation, they all reflect poorly on the God of peace that I claim to follow. Now, you may say, well, look, Matt, I'm sorry, God is God, and he's so powerful that he doesn't really need you vouching for him. And that's true. I know, that's true on one level. But we've just read that God remarkably has made flawed people like you and me, his ambassadors, and entrusted us, entrusted us with this message of reconciliation. So if that's true, how dare I risk bringing that into disrepute by ignoring conflict because it's complicated and it's easier to leave it be. Or jeopardize it by slagging off other churches because maybe their way of doing things is very different from ours. And by different, what I really mean is B-grade. Or cause unnecessary friction by insisting that I always get my, my rights regardless of the cost. Remember what else Paul wrote in, this first, in his first letter to the church in Corinth. He writes, what, what you guys, you Christians, you Christians are taking each other to court. You can't even work out that between yourselves. You'd rather risk compromising God's reputation in the eyes of outsiders than risk being wronged. Can you see? This is so much bigger than me and my individual, private spirituality or reputation. I'm now representing and emulating my father in my own flawed and puny, but not insignificant way. That matters. That really matters. And if you're not a Christian this morning, I can completely understand why this all may sound like pie in the sky, idealism at its best. What I'm promoting is risky. It's not pragmatic. It may not work out for you in the short to medium term. Christianity has at least some history involving pacifist Christian groups being persecuted and sometimes decimated by other not so peaceful Christian groups that were more powerful. Being a peacemaker, this kind of peacemaker, it's predicated on having a changed heart and following a God who you believe will make all things new and right but maybe not new and right in this life. Maybe it won't be until the kingdom comes in its fullness. It's also predicated on all people being made in the image of God and having the innate dignity and ethical imperative that goes with that. 
Now, again, you may understandably question all of that, but what's the, what's the, what's the alternative foundation for this kind of peacemaking? For this kind of peacemaking as opposed to just, you know, obvious naked power grabs or just kind of um, pitching to vested interests? Is it all being part of the same species? Like that's why we should all get along because we're all part of the same species? That sounds descriptive to me. It doesn't tell us, doesn't tell me at least, why we should make peace with our fellow humans just because we happen to be part of the same species. Is it belonging to the same nation or being citizens of the same country? Because that's working out real well at the moment in some parts of the world. Is it maybe adhering to the same moral truths? That's not so easy in a post-truth fake news world. Do you really think that vaguely defined vanilla values about human rights, etc., that that's going to stop the rise of nationalism or shut down totalitarian states or decrease the increasing distance between the haves and the have-nots? Me as a Christian, I don't share your faith if that's what you believe. I maintain we need changed hearts that will lead to self-sacrificial, humble peacemaking. And that all starts with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and accepting his offer of reconciliation. Let him inspire, motivate, and empower you in this worthy cause of true peacemaking. We've always needed it, but maybe, maybe now we need it more than ever. Thanks. Ro. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thank you for asking me. No, well, thanks for coming in. Thanks for saying yes. I know it's always a bit of a chance, a bit of a risk. Uh, for those at home who don't know, Ro and I have known each other now. I was thinking it must be at least a decade, I think. Probably it's more a, than that. More, more, more than a decade, yeah. yeah. Um, and amongst other things, Ro and I uh, both served on the church's leadership team for a number of years, which is also a whole lot of fun. Yeah. How long have you been part of MCC, the church, and how did you first come to join us? Okay, well, I... Um was looking for a church when I came to Hobart and hadn't found anything. And then Marinda um, knew my art history back, uh, background and she asked me to help with the community project, which was to do the mosaic on the oh. bridge at Margate. So I got involved with that and um, 27,000 tiles later, we started work. Um, it was nine months it took us wow. from beginning to, to the end, mm -hmm. but we had lots of fun. And the thing that amazed me most was the generosity of people like Jean and the others who came mm. round. I mean, we're sitting under tarps sometimes mm -hmm. with this awful black glue everywhere, um, putting these tiles on in the right mm. places. And Jean would come around and she'd say, open your mouth, Row," and she'd give me a little sip of water and she'd come around half an hour later with a date and then she'd come <laughs> around with some scones. So those people from the church, yeah. those volunteers maintained our sanity. You were involved with so many different people, so many different activities, with such, such frequency. It's really impressive. So I'd be keen to know, how have you kind of kept that going, particularly as you've gotten older? I don't need my walking stick yet. <laughs> it's so hard to find the right word for that. How have you maintained that since you've gotten more regal? Is that the right word? What, what's the word that I'm looking for? <laughs> no, that's for? worse, Matt. Okay. okay. It's fine. Uh, you've reached such an esteemed age. What about that now? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I've always loved people. I do re mm -hmm. genuinely like people. And I, my friends have been wonderful to me. I live mm -hmm. on my own. Yeah. And um, I couldn't do without them in my life. Mm -hmm. Um. And I just have a very tight calendar, okay. as you know. Yeah. Um, and I make sure I stay in touch with them. I really do. And they make sure they stay in touch with me too. Yeah. Yeah. And they're very, very supportive and very kind. And I've got a very wide range of friends, like from 92 down to 16 or something. Mm. So yeah. that's yeah. that's good. Yeah, again, like multi-generations. Absolutely. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so fair to say that's something that you put a... Um, that you not work at, but you put a bit of intention behind. It, do, do, it doesn't do. just happen, right? It hasn't no. just happened. Yeah. No, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, you've worked at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good, okay. And I should have gone with revered age. That's a good term, <laughs> that's a good term for revered. <laughs> What's the most important spiritual discipline or practice for you, Ro? 
besides prayer and church, mm -hmm. I think home group okay. is the most important thing for me because I'm fortunate enough to be with a group of really, really committed Christians mm -hmm. who are very, very, very knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and I have to soak all that up. Mm -hmm. um, but they are very supportive, and they, Alistair provides a great program, mm -hmm. and we have the most incredible discussions, mm. and sometimes they go on and on and on. I had to make a rule that they had to leave my house by 10 o'clock <laughs> because sometimes, yeah, you know, right. it just went on and on. But they do. They provide... They provide me with spiritual nourishment, yes. I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, give me insights into things that I would mm. never, never been able mm. to see or access. Yeah. So yeah. they enrich my life. Yeah. That, that's enrich good. my spiritual life. Yes. On a weekly basis. Ah, but they're yeah. also there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm stuck and I can't cope with something or something, mm -hmm. I. They're there too, and, and I yep. know that they're there. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So um, this, this could be a good time to make the distinction. It's not just a Bible study. It's not just a Bible no. study. It goes beyond that, well beyond Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You're pretty well travelled, as far as I know. You're an ex-deputy principal as well, so you had a long and illustrious teaching career. You're, you're an accomplished artist. Uh, you're obviously cultured. So why do you like AFL? <laughs> because I'm cultured. <laughs> Matt, it's fun. Yeah. It's had, I so was, many things in life are fun, though, right? You have access to so many fun things. Why? Like, why AF out of all the possible possible fun things? I guess as a child, my mm. memories are of Dad sitting in the car listening to the football and then coming inside and turning the football on oh, after golf. Yes. Dad yeah. and Mum were very sporting people. Okay. They were both professional people, but they mm. loved their sport. Oh. And so I was brought up in that sort of family, and my grandchildren are being brought up in exactly the same type of family, too. Sport is very important to them all. Yeah, right. And yes. so, um, you know, it was normal to mm -hmm. have the radio on and be listening mm -hmm. to sport. Mm -hmm. We didn't listen to much classical music, although yes. I, I yeah. do love it, yeah. um, or things like that. It was okay. always it yeah. was always a sporting thing. So, okay. so that was part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I go to the football with Marinda and we yes. have so much fun. <laughs> we really do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's fun being part of another group. Mm-hmm. Of people who mm. are passionate about yes. something, yeah, and everybody smiles at you if you've got your North Melbourne uni <laughs> clothes on. Yeah, I remember when we were on the leadership team together, like a while ago, um, and I recommended at, at, at that time after a discussion that all the members get a book, and the books were about church growth and discipleship, and they were pretty new. And then the understanding was everyone was going to do like a review of it. Uh, and to my uh, my enduring um, respect and admiration, you actually read the book, all the books, and then you put together a really good review and you presented it to us, and it was great. And one of the things that really stood out to me from that experience is that um, is that you found some of the ideas there um, not challenging is too strong a word, but novel, right? Like that, that were fair to say that they were fairly new, and you they kind were. of wrangled and you wrestled with them. I did. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you did so. You just didn't dismiss it out of hand. You didn't shut it down. But you were like generally curious and open minded in that regard, and that really struck me. So, why is being a lifelong learner important when it comes to your faith? And again, how do you kind of maintain, I guess, like both that attitude, but also that that practice or the habit? Well. I think the Bible, Bible is such a complex book. To me, it's in layers. Mm -hmm. I mean, children can read sections of it and find mm -hmm. it really important to their mm -hmm. spiritual life. Mm -hmm. um, I used to read the Bible, and mm. I'm sure now I'm with my group at home group, mm. I know that there's layers and layers and layers mm -hmm. more than I see in it. Yes. And I think that searching and that... Um, yeah, I do like understanding things, mm -hmm. and I do question a lot. Mm. Um, but I know I've got the home group there to provide me with some of the answers, and mm. I know God doesn't need us to understand everything. Well, there's no way. I always think of a grain of sand and think of all the sand in the world and mm. think, you know, that's that's me, and I know I'm important to God, I hope I am. And the... Um, there's so many people, if you think of all the sand in the mm. world, there's so many people mm -hmm. and there's so much to learn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What can we <laughs> pray for you or your loved ones as a church family? Um, I've got a niece who's in trouble with Parkinson's. Yeah. And 
there are crisis going on in her family. Mm. So I know she needs a lot of support, but mm -hmm. fortunately she's a Christian, so mm -hmm. prayer is part of her life and yes. her husband's life too. Yeah. I have a couple of people in um, the um, craft group mm. who um, are suffering with medical problems at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, I would like some support for them too. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Yes, apart they're the they're the main ones. Yes. Okay. Apart from all the other things that people worry about, like COVID. Yes. Yeah. Nineteen and the refugees and mm. all those other yep. huge, huge mm -hmm. world problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So your niece and her husband and family. Yes, please. And also uh, the Craft Coffee Chat Group, which yes. you've been yeah yes. an integral yes. part of for years now at MCC. Yeah. Yes. And some of the members there. Yes. Yeah. Good tight group. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll certainly get behind you in that. Thank you. Thanks again for coming in. Thanks for answering, thanks for answering my questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Okay, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Good morning. How's it going? And most importantly, how is the Bible reading going? So communion. What is communion about? Communion is about Jesus. Communion is about Jesus laying down his life for us on the cross and then being resurrected by the Father. It is all about Jesus and his sacrifice for us. So when you think about Jesus, what sort of mental picture do you have? It may be one inspired from the Bible, from a picture you have seen, from your imagination, or maybe you have a vision You've had a vision and, and, and that's how you see him. But in some way, we can all picture him in our hearts and minds. Here's a picture from the Bible. Jesus is light. So this is a picture made up totally of Bible verses. I'm not going to say what the Bible verses are, but you may recognize some of them. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. God once said, let the light shine out of darkness. And this is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts. He gave us this light by letting us know the glory of God that is in the face of Christ. In him was life, and that life was light for the people of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered the light. The true light was coming into the world. The true light gives light to all. Jesus said, People are judged by this fact. I am the light from God that has come into the world. He who follows the true way comes to the light. Then the light will show that the things he has done were done through God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Jesus is standing here now standing before us, reaching out to us. Let's hand over the sin that sometimes clings to us and the cares of the world that trouble us. Let him purify us now from our sin that we may not walk in darkness, but in the light of his life. So now take some bread and eat it and think of Jesus' body sacrificed for us on the cross. And now take some juice and think of the blood Jesus shed on the cross for us. Father, 
Let the light of your face shine upon us, Lord, for with you is the fountain of life. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. For you have delivered us from death and our feet from stumbling, that that we may walk before you in the light of life. And we thank you for this juice, which represents your blood that was shed to allow us to access this life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave, for communion. Uh, Well, for the last 14 weeks, uh, you've been watching this from your home on a Sunday, as have I. Uh, And Tuesdays, I've managed to be upstairs minding my own business while all the recording happens. Um, Thanking my lucky stars that I hadn't been roped down to do anything. Um, Well, I arrived home from shopping today and that luck has run out. There's no one else, Louie. There's only Al and I here. Please come and do announcements, please. And here I am. So, Hello, Louis. I'm owed something or another. Um, so I'm here for the news. It's uh, nice to see you remotely. I'm looking forward to when we can catch up in person. It'll be much nicer uh, than this, as nice as this is, of course. So, uh, the news for today. The first bit is some really exciting news. As you know, uh, the love, no, sorry, it's called Channel Churches Care is well underway um, and we've in the last week had two really generous donations from Nick Street and Jackie Petrusma with the local Liberal Party who have donated us a fridge and a freezer um, which is fantastic so we'll have them set up at church to hold a lot of the food that we get from food bank that we're using to create the food hampers that are going out to people in need so um, that's been really exciting and that means that we can buy a few more things that need um, storage so That's been good. And Channel Church's care is going really well. Please just continue to pass the word around. I think it's important. We know that there's people who actually need some support, um, but they might not necessarily know that we're able to help. So please um, spread the word. And if you know of anyone, let us know. Um, I'd like to thank again Todd and Vernon, um, particularly for all the work they're doing with the playground at church. Um, If you have a chance, drive past and have a look. We've got some fence posts in now, and the aim is to have all of that fencing completed by third term, when, which is when Beehive's going back, and hopefully some point after that we'll be going back as well. So we'll have a lovely new fence and a really big playground, which will be really exciting. So thanks again. There's been lots of different people putting in lots of time, and, um, and we all appreciate it. Now, uh, this week you may have started off a bit like me um, when all of this hit, and I had some great intentions to, to contact lots of people and Um, see how things were going and the fact is things have just been crazy. Everyone I talk to has just been snowed under with kind of getting through things but I'd really encourage you to um, pick up the phone and call somebody or invite somebody to go for a walk or make the use of our MCC Family Facebook page to try and connect with people Um, because I think we're all a bit siloed in this environment and it'd be really great to make sure we are keeping those connections. So maybe in this coming week we could all take a chance to ring somebody that we haven't rung or hook up with somebody maybe that we wouldn't even normally hook up with um, just so we can continue to see how we're all going um, and continue to pray for each other as well. Speaking of prayer, I'm just about to pray. Um, Each week we've been... um, praying for a different church in our local area um, because with all of this happening we're all we're all in it together facing a lot of similar struggles and challenges in terms of when we go back how do we serve our local community when we're in isolation um, and this week would really love you and I will pray as well for Enjoy Church who are based in Merton Vale Circuit in Kingston. Um, their pastor Martin um, has been doing a lot of work during this time and I'm sure they're as snowed under as we've been So in a minute, I'll pray um, for them. And it's really good. In the last week, I've also been talking to a number of churches in the broader Hobart community just about what they're doing and and how they're facing it. And it's been really encouraging to know that we're part of a bigger boat. There's a lot of churches going through this and working out what the future's looking like. So um, I think if we can continue to pray for the Christians and the churches around us, I know it would be really appreciated. So I might pray now if you'd like to join me. Dear God, we thank you that you're a good God who loves us, who knows us and who is with us through all of these crazy times. Um, we'd like to pray particularly for Martin and the church, the Enjoy Church in, um, in Kingston, as they look at how they can look after their congregation and serve the community around them 
um, and make a tangible difference in the areas that they work. And we pray that you give them wisdom and um, sustain their efforts as they look at how we do church in a really in a new world. We pray also for all the broader churches around who are also in the same boat. Um, I pray that we can work together, learn from each other, encourage each other um, as we move through the coming months. I'd like to pray for the leadership team of our church who um, are just working so hard to continue to look after us and to find ways that we can reconvene um, going forwards. It's an absolutely massive job and I know that they've been so busy and I just pray that you continue to sustain them and guide them um, and give them strength and clarity as we move forward. I pray for all of our congregation who um, are dispersed around the place at the moment. Um, I pray for those. We know that there's so much going on at the moment with um, surgery, um, with sick parents, with loved ones who are interstate and facing surgery and all sorts of things that make us feel a it's hard when we're disconnected to really look after these people and I just pray that you strengthen everybody, give them hope and a realisation that you're with us through this, um, that your hand guides us and no matter what happens, um, you'll be with us. So I pray that we have a good week ahead of us. Um, in Jesus' name, Amen. Right, Joel's going to provide us with one more song. Thank you, Joel, for all the work that you've been doing with this. It's really appreciated. Um, it'll also give us a chance to wrangle our children back from wherever they've disappeared to. Um, and Meg will have the children's story straight after that, so please stick around. See you later. God's righteousness revealed The Son of Man Son of God His kingdom comes Jesus Redemption sacrifice Now glorified And 
endless glory some don't know about For the majesty and power of this kingdom's king has come Hi everybody, today I have a video about how Jesus is like us. We all know Jesus was completely God, but he's also completely human. He was a kid, he was a baby, he had to learn how to walk and he had to learn how to talk. He had to learn how to do maths and that probably was pretty hard for him sometimes. And sometimes it's easy to remember that he is completely God, but we forget about the, the bit that he's completely human. And even if it's really hard to understand, both things are really true. And so this video is to remind us all about his, his humanness and how he was like us. God's story. Jesus was like us. So part of God's story is about his son named Jesus. It goes like this. Even though Jesus is God, he's also like us too. You might have already heard some stories about Jesus. Some stories are really famous. Like how Jesus was born at Christmas, or how he died on a cross and then came back to life on Easter. You also might have heard that Jesus taught big crowds or made sick people feel better and healed them. He did do all those things, but that's not all there is to know about Jesus. He also did a lot of normal stuff, like help his mom with chores, play with his brothers and sisters, maybe even snored. The Bible never actually says Jesus snored, but it does say he was like us. Anyway, one normal thing we know Jesus liked for sure was being with his friends. Kids, do you like to hang out with friends? You probably have friends who like to play different things. Maybe some of your friends like to play video games. Some go swimming or to the playground. Some like to chase around fake aliens with lasers. The really fun thing about friends is being together, no matter what you're playing. Well, Jesus spent a lot of time with friends. He would go over to their houses a lot just to hang out and usually eat some food. They sometimes went fishing or rode on a boat. Jesus had 12 best friends. They were called his disciples. A disciple is anyone who follows Jesus. We can be disciples too, if we follow him. And the really cool thing is, Jesus wants to be friends with us and everybody. And we know that because he was always making new friends. He even made friends with people nobody else liked because Jesus likes everyone. If Jesus wasn't with his friends, he might've been doing a normal thing like resting. This one day, Jesus was so tired he took a nap on a boat and he didn't even wake up when a huge storm came. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night because you heard thunder and lightning? Well imagine how scary it would be if your whole bed was jumping up and down too. Not you jumping up and down on your bed, the bed jumping up and down on the floor. That's what it felt like for Jesus in that boat. But he was so tired, he was sleeping right through. Jesus knew God was with him, so he could sleep even during a storm. And he knew it's important to rest when you're tired. Sometimes Jesus rested by going somewhere by himself so he could talk to God. One place he really liked going was into a garden. Picture sitting under a big tree in the shade or climbing your favorite tree. We don't know if Jesus liked climbing trees, but we do know that Jesus liked to be alone to pray and that sometimes he prayed outside. You also might not have known that Jesus loved going to parties. Think about the parties you've been to birthday parties, Christmas parties. You're not the only one there, right? Usually lots of people go because parties are a way for us to celebrate something really cool with people we care about. Jesus loved doing that too. Once, Jesus went to a wedding with his family and friends, but right in the middle of the reception, the wine ran out. There was only water left. Jesus saved the day by turning that water into wine. It was his first miracle. A miracle is when something amazing happens that only God can do. When Jesus did this miracle, the people at the party were able to keep right on having a good time. Jesus played with his friends, rested, and celebrated many times in the Bible. 
We just don't talk about those things as often because they're regular activities that regular people, like you and me, do all the time. But even though Jesus was the Son of God and able to heal sick people and tell amazing stories to huge crowds, he was also a lot like us. And that's part of the story of Jesus. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Jesus was born on Christmas. He taught thousands of people. He healed the sick. Jesus also knew it was important to be with his friends, rest when he was tired, and celebrate when something exciting happened. So he did, just like us. And that's a part of God's story. One thing I find really comforting about Jesus being like us and having been completely human is that he completely understands what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to be happy and sad and he knows what it's like to be stressed or relaxed. He even knows that it's hard work to do what God wants sometimes and to follow God's ways. But because he understands, he knows what we need to get through it and he can help us because he's been through it. So that's what I find really good to know and to remember. So let's pray about that, hey? Thank you, Jesus, that you're completely human. Thank you that because you're human, you completely understand what it's like to be us. Thank you that you know what we need to get through all the things that come our way and that you're always looking after us. And thank you that you can help us with everything we need. Amen.